So, like I was saying right now, with natural law, it's going to be a different version of ethics of what's right and wrong. So we're talking about last time uh, how some people may take religion as a guide to morality, but we saw that doesn't work. Let's have a little X on it. Because the Viking man theory, what it lacks is clear reasons why something is right or wrong. It just simply relies on authority and saying, well, this is what they tell me is right or wrong. This is what my religion tells me. But it doesn't have any reasons to back it up. And that's the issue with divine command theory. Now, when we talk about natural law, natural law is going to claim that actions are right just because they're natural and wrong just because they're unnatural. So it's making this distinction between natural and unnatural, saying that uh, a clear determination of right and wrong actions and what you're, whether you're doing something right or wrong can be determined by nature. And hopefully we'll start to see why this has actually become uh, a very, I would say, serious sort of uh, position or taken very seriously, even though I will tell you that there are many flaws. There. So I think in order to understand the reasoning behind it, and so this is what I, I think I mentioned before with uh, logic. Logic, I'm uh, sorry, and, and philosophy in general. Philosophy, we want to understand the reasons behind somebody's claims or beliefs when they state that this is true or this is not true. So what I wanted to do is give you a, a little bit of a background about what natural law is and how they came about with the reason that nature is going to tell us what's good or bad. And there's three main, uh, I would say, influences in the history of natural law. So this is a little bit extra from what the book has. They, they go into a little bit of it, but I, I want to go into a little bit more depth. The Stoics are a huge uh, influence of natural law. Aristotle, which we'll talk about later in virtue ethics, he is also a major figure uh, responsible for natural law. And I think the, the largest figure and the most significant to carve out natural law was St. Thomas Aquinas. So if you look at the Stoics, the Stoics are a group of Greek and Roman philosophers in ancient times. And they have this belief that how you should live your life is in a very stoic manner. Because we, we still use the word today, stoic. Does anybody know what stoic means? What if I describe somebody as being stoic? Let me have a clue what that means if, if I'm saying that somebody is stoic. Is someone that doesn't seem to be affected by its surroundings, mostly their emotions? Right. So that's how we describe people if they're very, um, sometimes people would describe them as very cold is that they don't, they're not very expressive with their emotions. But this actually, the origin of this comes from the Stoics themselves. Why, the, why it comes from the Stoics is that the Stoics believe that the problem why people run into various issues in life is that they let their emotions control them. So why you do stupid shit is basically because your emotions get the best of you. So something like anger, you're very angry at somebody and you say something that later you regret. 
but in the moment they were so angry. That's an example of what the Stoics are against. They they think that you're better off living a better life, a more fulfilling life, if you can control your emotions and you can think with reason and logic at all times. And they have this idea of the sage, that someone is, has moral intellectual perfection. Life. That would be the highest level you can reach, is complete control of your emotions and being able to address everything in a logical, rational manner. And they really did try to practice what they preached. They really try to live this way. Um, so this wasn't just empty words or something like that. This was actually a living philosophy. Of, this is how they adopted their life. This is how they approached life. Another really important aspect of the Stoics is that how they saw their religion. They saw the religion as not as divine beings on Mount Olympus or in heaven or something like that. For them, the gods for them are part of nature. They're part of the everyday. So you can find the gods within the forest or the desert or anything. They're part of nature. This is where I get this kind of concept of Mother Nature or Mother Earth. And they have, why they think the gods are part of nature is that nature for them seems very rationally ordered and designed. That everything seems to work well in nature. Everything seems to have a purpose. So the grass grows, cows eat the grass, we eat the cows. You know, eventually we turn into, you know, fertilizer and we fertilize the grass, right? So it seems like everything seems to be well ordered. That there doesn't seem to be a mistake here. It seems well planned. And if a tree has a purpose, grass has a purpose, animals have a purpose, we have a purpose then, according to them. So we want to reach our purpose, our telos, is what they call it. It's what we're supposed to do, what our purpose is. And since human beings, since we're rational beings, we can reason and think and determine and judge what our purpose is, what we're here for. So you see, if you're in control of your emotions, if you control and you're rational, then you should be able to figure out what your purpose is. Like. When you let your emotions run you, you, that prevents it, then you're unable to get to that level. Did everybody understand that so far? Yes. So those concepts are going to be very important. They're going to come back right now. Aristotle's the next big influence. Aristotle, and don't forget any of this stuff because this stuff will come. Uh, when we talk about virtue ethics later in the course. Aristotle came next, I would say, chronologically. So first there were the Stoics, and then Aristotle came later. And Aristotle has this concept called eudaimonia. It's really hard to translate in English, because we don't really have that concept. But Aristotle talks about the virtues and the vices. That's what virtue ethics is going to be about. Virtues are characteristics or traits that you aspire to. Vices are characteristics or traits that you want to avoid. So being courageous is a virtue. Being patient is a virtue. Uh, being stingy, uh, uncompassionate, those are vices. Those are things you want to stay away from. So, you're trying to develop your, your character your ex, as excellence. And so this is a term for the Greeks called arete. Arete is this notion that how you strive to live a better life is that you want to develop a legacy, something that 
when you leave behind that can be honored and respected. And that's how you essentially live forever. Like you're, you becoming immortal or is in a sense because you've left a legacy behind that no one will ever forget you. So you want to strive for that in life. But it's a skill then. This is really important. Aristotle did not believe that you were just simply born good. Well, pure and good. To be a good person, to have good characteristics, good character traits, you have to work at it. It's skill. It's something that you have to go out there every day and exercise. To be a courageous person, you have to be a courageous person every day. It's not like, well, I was courageous this one time, and the rest of the time I'm a coward. That is, that's, you know, we can commit somebody for being courageous at one time, but a courageous person overall is somebody who's courageous every day. They strive for that. And so he has this analogy about the archer, is that let's say you had an archer and she shoots a bow and arrow. To get the bullseye, she has to practice, right? It's a skill, it's something that she has to work on and develop. That's not the same thing as luck. That's why I want to kind of maybe care, uh, clarify. Like this happened to me once, I was at a bar and I threw, we were playing darts and I threw a dart and I hit the bullseye. But don't ask me to do it again. Because I don't have the skill to do that. I just got lucky, right? Not a professional dart player. But somebody who's the who's pro can get close to the they may not always get exactly the same bullseye or whatever, but they have a much better chance at it. And that's what I was saying about love and being a good person. You have, with practice and developing these uh, characteristics, you have a better chance in life to be a courageous person if it's something on a daily basis. The person who's doing that is expressing eudaimonia. What does that mean? This is where it's hard to translate in English. We don't have that concept, like I said. Uh, some philosophers have said, well, what he means by eudaimonia is that they're exhibiting, she's exhibiting happiness or a general well being about her person. The last one is flourishing. I personally think flourishing is maybe the closest to what I think Aristotle means in English. That the person is flourishing as a person, as their character, their personality, their whole being is flourishing. They're growing and developing in life. So you'll start to see all these concepts start to come together in natural law. This is why I was saying uh, I'm bothering to take the time to go uh, give you a little bit of the past about natural law because later in history, St. Thomas Aquinas comes around. And St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, is a saint. He's a Catholic saint. And he take, he's read his Aristotle, he's read his Stoics, he knows his philosophy. Uh, some people forget that, that, uh, that the history of the Catholic Church is deeply uh, embedded with philosophy, Greek and Roman philosophy. And so he's read uh, his philosophers, and he thinks that, he comes to the conclusion that how do you develop a notion of morality, of right and wrong, good and bad, and not fall into the same problems as divine commandment? So he's read his Plato as well. He knows his uh, Euthyphro story. He knows that 
just relying on divine command theory alone is not going to give you good reasons to follow God. So he wants another version of morality for the church. And he comes up with this idea that perhaps nature can help us see what we should and should not do. You just look at nature and you understand. So St. Thomas Aquinas is an interesting person in history. I'll say that. Uh, he's an Italian, uh, Italian Dominican priest. Uh, but he, he, like I said, he's read his Aristotle, he's read his Plato, but he's has a very particular interpretation. We've talked about interpretation before. <clears throat> a lot of people don't know all, as well is that a lot of Aristotle's writings were saved, even though they're thousands of years old, they were saved um, because they were translated into Arabic by uh, Islamic scholars. So there's a huge um, view of, uh, there's a huge level of text for Islamic scholars and Aristotle. Questions so far? No. Okay. So Islamic scholars had a particular interpretation of Aristotle. They interpreted Aristotle along as being monocyclistic and pancyclistic. Monocyclism is the concept that all human beings share one consciousness. If you've heard, ever heard of the term all one, that actually comes from that tradition because their idea is that everything is God. Part of God. We're all part of God. So really when it comes down to it, we're all part of the same. This is directly from Aristotle and so it's that everything in nature has a soul or consciousness. It's just the level or the complexity. So animals have souls, plants have souls, uh, but human beings just have a more complex level. But St. Thomas Aquinas disagrees with that, as you can imagine, because for the Catholic Church, you can't really have a philosophy where all human beings share the same consciousness or soul, because if you're condemning people to heaven and hell, or hell, then they have to have a soul to be judged on their own, right? Because we're all part of the same thing, then we're all going to hell, or we're all going to hell. <laughs> and for them, that wouldn't make sense. So they, so St. Thomas rejects monocyclism. He would also reject pancyclism because uh, a lot of people don't know as well is that the Catholic Church does, I think until very, very recently, only a couple of years ago, uh, did not consider animals to have souls. It's not part of the religious tradition that animals would have souls. So this is bad news, you know, if you think you're going to see a dog in heaven or something like. It's not going to happen <laughs> according to the Catholic Church because animals don't have that ability. So he's kind of picking and choosing what elements of Aristotle's philosophy to adopt. And he also is in debate with the Franciscan tradition. The Franciscans are Christians, but they reject the influence that he's trying to promote of Greek philosophy, Greek and Roman philosophy into the, into the religion. So there's this really famous debate uh, where the Catholic Church had to decide whether to adopt Aquinas' philosophy of Christianity mixed with Aristotle and the Stoics, or just adhere to what they had before, 
which is actually influenced already by Plato from St. Augustine. So guess who won that debate? Aquinas or the Franciscans? I want to bet $20 for <laughs> the Franciscans. <laughs> Thank you for those twenty dollars. You just lost. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> Saint Thomas Aquinas. This is why he's a saint. Saint Thomas Aquinas wins that debate. What you have as modern Catholicism, if you're Catholic, part of the tradition of Catholicism right now is that it is partly influenced by the Stoics and Aristotle philosophy. It's also mixed, like I mentioned right now, by an earlier saint, St. Thomas Aquinas, I'm sorry, St. Augustine. St. Augustine incorporated Plato's philosophy into Christianity. So really what we call modern Christianity, modern Catholicism, in particular, is a mixture of different Greek and Roman philosophy. And you'll see that if you ever go to the Vatican. Uh, I do tell my students, uh, on my trip to the Vatican, there are a number of statues in there commemorating Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, there's a gigantic mural called the School of Athens, which takes up an entire wall of the uh, of the Vatican, and it's completely dedicated to all the famous Greek philosophers. So the Catholic Church knows their history; they understand where they got these ideas from. And I think there's even a church on the on the east side of town called Saint. Named after St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas Church. He's a major figure. Um, this is why he was canonized as a saint, is that the church felt that he contributed by providing this overall philosophy of morality to the Stoics. Who is the other yeah. <laughs> this um this program is not the best. <laughs> I tried to use this program because everybody has easy access to it, but it's it, not the I would not recommend it. Ideal. <laughs> Let's see. Let me get it started again. There we go. Yeah, there we go. We're back. We're back. Okay. So why we're talking about St. Thomas Aquinas is because he is the originator for natural law. And we'll see how. So for Aquinas' view of natural law is that then everything has to be well ordered and designed. Why? Because there shouldn't be any sort of mistakes in nature. Why is that? Because God, according to him, God created nature, God created everything in the universe that we see. So God is a rational being, which we talked about last time in the Divine Command 3. In order for God to be perfect, he must be rational. He doesn't just do things because he feels like it. It has to have a good reason why. So the same thing with nature then. Why is nature the way it is? Is because God planned it that way. He's like the ultimate engineer, designer. And see how he's borrowing from the Stoics. Remember, the Stoics talked about the telos, that everything has in nature has a purpose. So he's borrowing that idea from them. 
And that how can we know what our human nature is? What we're supposed to do in life? Remember coming back to the Stoics and Aristotle? We have to use our reason, our ability, our rationale to think out and understand the purpose in life is. And this is a misunderstanding that I, I see a lot. That relig uh, the misunderstanding is the belief that religion is solely uh, based on faith. That is not quite true. For St. Thomas Aquinas, you couldn't just base your religion on faith. You actually had to have a certain level of understanding because God gave you the gift of reason. If you have the ability to reason as a human being, you have that uh, capacity, then God, if God designed everything, then he must have gave you that capacity for a good reason. You're supposed to think, you're supposed to reason and come to the conclusion about your own thing, about your religion, not just simply believe. If you're not using your reason, then in a sense you're rejecting God's gift. This is why I think there's a misunderstanding now that it, religion is solely based on faith. According to Aquinas, you need that rationale to understand what you believe. And if you decide not to use your reason, then yeah, it's a rejection of God's gift. You're using, you're not using something God gave you, and He must have gave, He must have gave you that for a good reason. So then that is why for human beings we have certain moral responsibilities that other things don't have. So parents don't really have a moral responsibility. But because we can reason on that level, and remember the Catholic Church for a long time did not accept animals as, as happy souls, right? Uh, because they didn't think they could reason, then human beings are the ones who are the beings that are responsible and then have a moral responsibility for what they do. And they should know right from wrong. So he goes from what nature is, what our nature is, to what our nature should be, what we should do in life, how we should be. Everybody follow along so far? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> if there's questions, stop me at any time. So then you come up with this this the this concept of like if it's natural then it must be good. That's something that you hear a lot, right? It, this assumption we talk about, remember with the example of condoms right being unnatural or whatever so we make that connection now that if it's natural it's good if it's unnatural it's bad and of course like i said this is all part of the greek philosophy that he's adopting from aristotle in that everything should have a well-formed and a well-functioning role that's part of the eudaimonia right the flourishing and that everything should be reaching its full potential the telos coming from the stoics so if you're not adhering to your nature then you're not doing what god put you here to do then you're not you're not behaving in a good manner. If you reject your nature, then you're doing something bad, is the concept. Which I, you'll see right now is highly contentious. I, the spoiler is like, this is not going to really work. Because there's going to be a lot of problems with this kind of view.
Now, some will argue that it's a good view because why? Because it explains how morality can be objective. Two, it explains why morality is best suited for human beings, that we don't put this level of responsibility on animals or plants, but solely on human beings. It also is supposed to explain the origins of morality, where this is a meta ethical question, right? Where does right and wrong come from? According to natural law, they have the answer. And for four, it explains how moral knowledge, how can they know right from wrong? How is that possible? It also seems, claims that it can provide that as well. So those are the four benefits for natural law. They can answer those issues. But this is where we're going to run into the problem. So remember I said in the book, we're going to always go back from uh, Schiffer, the way Schiffer Landau wrote the book is that he's going to say that, oh, hold on a second. Okay, sure. He's going to say that in every chapter, what are the pros to the theory and what are the cons to the theory? So what does the theory have going for it and what does the theory going against it? Because no theory is perfect. So this is where we're examining the pros and the cons of the theory. So we start getting into the, those were the pros, but now we're going to start getting into the cons. What are the problems with this kind of view? If it explains how morality can be objective, why? Because according to natural law theories, nature, our human nature is an objective concept independent of us. Like we have a particular nature and that's more than just our opinion. Because nature is something that's independent of um, opinion. But that doesn't mean that's also, that all natural law theories are religious, though. I'm going to clarify that and we'll see why. Some people have adopted natural law without the religion. They just simply say, well, nature is the, uh, the ultimate decider. Nature is going to be the judge. The second is that how does it explain it's best suited for human beings? It's because we can reflect and analyze on our actions. We have, remember, the rationale. We can stop ourselves and think about what we're doing. Maybe this is why it's a bad idea for people to blame their dog for doing stuff. I've seen people yell at their dog like the dog understands. <laughs> okay, it's very confusing. Like, I don't think the dog understands that those are your favorite shoes or that's your favorite couch or whatever. It's just, uh, I don't think the dog's getting any of this. Like, you're speaking very loudly and you're frightening the dog, but I don't think they understand necessarily what's going on. And this is the case with, uh, for natural law theories. They're saying, yes, exactly. That's why uh, I can hold a person responsible for messing with my couch, but I can't hold up an animal responsible for damaging the couch. Because we're moral agents. Remember that term that uh, we spoke about in metaethics? Agent. Agent is somebody who is in control of their actions. So then they deserve praise or blame for their intentions because they are they can think and reason about what they're gonna do. And so remember that distinction when I say intentions are praise or blameworthy and actions are good or bad. Don't get those terms mixed up, but it's really important. Because we can assess somebody's intentions independent of their actions and the consequences of their actions. They're not necessarily connected all the time. And then three, it explains the origins of morality. How, did, how does it do that? How does it explain where we get right and wrong from? Because human nature relies on humans, of course. This is actually kind of Aristotle. I think 
Aquinas is borrowing this from Aristotle directly. Uh, this is uh, part of Aristotle's philosophy that's really different from Plato's. Because you'll find that Plato and Aristotle don't agree on almost anything. Uh, this is why I, I think it's philosophically it's an issue I think for the Catholic Church if you have a mixture of all these different philosophies but they don't agree with each other sometimes they contradict each other I think it gets pretty confusing this part at times so the idea he's borrowed from Aristotle here is that you can't say that something has something unless it exists, right? So unless there's human beings around, you can't talk about morality. So if there's no human beings on earth and we really and there's just animals, we can't really talk about right and wrong. It would just be nature. And then four, it explains how moral knowledge is possible. So how do we know right from wrong? This is an epistemological issue. Remember what we said about epistemology and, and ethics. Epistemology means the study of knowledge. That's a big area in philosophy. Maybe the biggest is that a lot of philosophers work in that field. How do we justify that we know something? What is justification? What is evidence? So how does it propose that it can give us good evidence for right and wrong, good justification, is that there's two types or two forms of knowledge that epistemologists usually talk about. This is really, really important. So focus on this one. There's conceptual truth, which in Latin is a priori. A conceptual truth is something that you understand is true simply by understanding the concept alone. So the classic example in philosophy is that all bachelors, the statement, all bachelors are unmarried men. By definition, a bachelor is an unmarried man. So you don't have to go and see every unmarried man to check that they're a bachelor. It's by definition, right? So it's a kind of truth that you know just by the concept. That is opposed to empirical truth. Empirical truth, on the other hand, is a type of truth where you have to see evidence. You have to use your senses to understand and know something. So the, the statement, all bachelors are bold, is something I would have to go out there and see just because I understand what a bachelor means doesn't tell me whether they're bold or not, right? So the, another way to kind of characterize these two uh, notions of knowledge, I would say conceptual truth is more like truths that you would find as well in mathematics. Like all rectangles have four sides. Notice I don't have to go through every single rectangle to see if it has four sides, right? By definition, it should have four sides. Empirical truths, on the other hand, are more like scientific truths. Things that we have to go out and observe in the world and see. Now, this is where the problem starts for natural law. If we're supposed to go right from wrong, that is that a conceptual truth or an empirical truth? And this is where we get to Hume. Uh, David Hume is a Scottish philosopher. He's one of my favorite philosophers because he's very skeptical about everything. Uh, and he challenges this view because he says, well, wait a minute. If there are only two types of truth in the world, conceptual truth or empirical truth, it doesn't seem like moral claims fit into either category. To say something is right or wrong doesn't seem to fit into like a mathematical truth or a conceptual truth. And it doesn't seem to be an empirical or scientific truth. 
So there'd be something right or wrong. So then that's why he comes to the conclusion that, well, then there must be no such thing as moral knowledge. He would be, I would say, a moral nihilist because he's denying that there is a such thing as right or wrong or whatever. Because you wouldn't be able to know about that. That's not something you can know. It can't be true. I think, in some sense, this argument should sound familiar. It's very similar to Mackey's argument we talked about in metaethics. But how does natural law come back and try to argue in response to this? They're going to say, well, of course it's a natural truth that something is right or wrong. But Hume is going to point out, and this is extremely important, Hume is going to point out you can't go from what ought to be the case from what is the case. So you can't go from what is to what ought to be. Just because it is like that doesn't mean that it should be like that. Like somebody you should tell Trump about this. <laughs> like, I don't know if you saw that thing with Trump where he's like about people, uh, I think it was a reporter, right? Asking about the coronavirus and the number of infections in the United States. And they well, what it is what it is. They're like, okay, it's true that these this amount of people have been infected by the virus. I mean, that's because they should be, right? Or that that's the right thing. So just because it is that way doesn't mean it should be that way. But natural law theorists are going to argue, no, it should be. That's not the way nature is, is how it should be. So if we understand, if we just simply understand what our human nature is, then we'll know what to do. But what is the problem here, though? What do you have what do you have to know first in order to understand what you should do? If they say that nature is what you sh that you should follow along with what nature, human nature, human nature dictates, what do you have to answer first? What do you have to do first, though? We must know what is natural first. Right. So how do you distinguish what human nature is in the first place in order to say that you should follow it? And so there's some answers to this question. Uh, Schaefer and I go through three of them uh, that throughout history, people have tried to attempt to answer that. Some have claimed that what our human nature is is what is innately human, which we're, what we're born with, some trait that we naturally have. The problem with this view, though, is that just because we're born with something doesn't tell us anything about whether it's right or wrong. Also, it's very difficult to find something that we're that all human beings possess. This is why it goes to two. The usual answer for this 
type of approach is that, well, what separates us from everything else? Human being national. Aristotle. And what makes us special? All that is because we, of course, we're. And reason or not doesn't tell us really anything about what we should or should not do. This brings us to the third traditional answer, and this is where I think it is probably the most contentious. This is probably their best attempt at carving out morality, is that the third uh, view is a theological view. Going back, coming from the word telos, right? Everything has a purpose. Some will argue means we're designed to do something or be something. Aristotle uh, is famous for this type of philosophy. It's what we call functionalism. A quick example of what that means is that Aristotle would say that what makes an object that thing, like a knife, is that a knife can cut. So if the object can cut, then that's what makes it a knife, what it does. What it does is what it is. And so taking this to human nature, they want to say that whatever we're designed to do is what we are or what we should be. Now, there's two views of this. One, you can say that God gave us the design. He designed us this way, and this is what we should do. But I would say if you take that approach, you're going to run into all the problems that we saw in the previous chapter about divine humanity, the different interpretations, right? Different scriptures, like it doesn't really solve those problems either. Now, there's a non religious interpretation of natural law. That's a second one. But some will argue instead of God providing us the design, really the design just comes from evolution and natural selection. That over time we're designed to do certain things, and that's what we should do. Two models they use to, to support this. The first one is the efficiency model. That's the functionalist model. What our function is, what we're designed to do, what we do best. So the example I think in the book is like, what is the heart, the human heart, what is it best at doing? What does the human heart do better than any other organ of the body? Provide oxygen to the rest of the body. Right, by, by doing what? Pumping blood. Right, so that's what they want to say its function is, what its purpose is. And so then they want to take that idea and say, well, what are, whatever human beings are best at, is what we're designed to do, what we should do. But what are human beings best at? Um, reasoning, using logic. Um. Not lately. <laughs> I mean, like, I think not lately. Uh, this is where we said about uh, logic, right? It's not how people actually use it. 
Right. I think these are very significant issues, especially with uh, a lot of issues going on right now regarding racism, right? And the virus, uh, just the other day, like I went to the store and there's a number of people without any mask or any protective gear. I don't know if they think they're just immune or they're superhuman or it's like, it's not gonna affect me, but it doesn't seem very rational to me to walk around without any protective gear. Like it's like you're immune to it. Uh, and there's a number of right, racial claims, uh, discrimination, uh, racism that don't seem rational as well. So human beings, we're not always the best at reasoning. <laughs> and so I don't, this is why I think the efficiency model falls apart here, is that just because we're really good at something, maybe we're really good at racism, <laughs> better than any other animal or something, doesn't mean that's what we should do, right? Uh, the fitness model, on the other hand, I've heard people argue this as well, that the fitness model coming from evolution is that a organism is designed to survive and reproduce, adapt, and that's what it should do. But again, we run into a number of moral problems, because if you're going to say that what we're designed or what we should do is survive and reproduce, we can accomplish those goals but in very unethical ways, right? We can kill others. Uh, the action of a rape, could we provide a, a child, right? But it doesn't mean it's a good thing. So the fitness model doesn't really work either, I think. Just be, and this is where it comes back to the issue for that Hume pointed out. You can't simply go from what is the case to what ought to be the case. Just because it is true people do this doesn't mean that they should do it. And this is where that connection, going back to that example we had in logic about the commons being unnatural, and therefore being unnatural, they're bad. They should be bad. Uh, this sort of notion, yeah, is a very natural law approach. But it doesn't really work. I mean, because then you're going to come to some ridiculous conclusions with this type of philosophy. Because then you would have to say that, well, headphones, are they natural or unnatural? Natural. So we use them to listen to, to things like I'm doing right now. I have my headphones on. But what are your ears designed to do? What would be an explanation? What are, why do we develop ears? How do they help us survive? To survive? I think in... No, it doesn't help us. Well, it's, ideally it, it might help us because how do you know if a predator is coming or not? You should be able to hear them, right? Like to hear danger coming, right? You should use your ears. But then if you go along with that idea and say, if you're interfering with a natural process, then you're doing something wrong, then according to that view, then wearing your headphones to listen to music is wrong because it's unnatural. But that's silly, right? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and then you get to other sort of ridiculous conclusions like, well, if you're not having sex to reproduce, then you're doing something unnatural. Because sex's purpose is for procreation. 
But is it really sex's purpose? Is that what really sex's purpose is, is procreation? Go back and think about the what the models are saying. That they're saying, well, whatever it's best that the function is model, right? Then that's what it should do. Is sex is its purpose, is its functional purpose procreation? I think biologically, yes. Is it? How successful is sex in procreating an individual? So and another way of saying it, what are the chances? Like if we're good natural law theorists and we examine nature, right? Like your Aquinas told us to. We look at nature. What are the actual chances of a, of a female becoming pregnant? Let's imagine, like, let's take out contraception and all that stuff. What are the actual chances of a woman becoming pregnant or female becoming pregnant? No. No, baby. Yep. See, this is the problem with sex education. We're adults and we can't answer this question, <laughs> which is an important question, right? We should know what the actual chances are. It's like, where do these children come from? I don't know. <laughs> so what are the, like, I mean, we're all on computers, right? But what are the actual chances of a woman becoming pregnant? She might be getting pregnant. Um, do we take out all the um, birth control and everything? Right. So, um, what is what? What does the research show us? The the rate, the chances of uh, pregnancy due to sex. A good 99%. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. Did everybody find any answers? Um, 15 to 25 percent. Okay. That's, that's not. 15 to 25 percent. But think about that for a second. So if it's 15 to 25 percent, is it really, is sex really the best thing for appropriate? If, it's, if it works 15 to 25 percent of the time? No. No, but I mean, that's like saying a can opener works 15 to 25% of the time. My car starts 15 to 25% of the time. <laughs> it's not even half, right? Just a quarter at most. So maybe this is what the, the issue here is, and, and some people have argued against natural law in regards to this, is that Perhaps sex's purpose, this assumption that sex is there for appropriation, doesn't really make sense with natural law because sex doesn't appear to be very successful at that. So it's a very poor design. It's like God made a very poor machine here. 
And if we adopt the natural law approach, what's most likely the result of sex? So like we were talking about right now, more than likely it appears like if we're good natural law theorists, that sex is probably not, purpose is not procreation. This is even very successful if it's only 15 to 25% of the time. Probably more likely than not would be pleasure. If we're a natural law theorist, right? If we're just examining, observing. I mean, I think that's why a lot of people have sex, right? It's for pleasure. Um, so that, but the point here is that, um, as you can see, nature doesn't really tell you what's right or wrong. It's not a very good guide for determining morality. Questions about that? Nope. So everybody's in agreement. Sex's purpose is pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah. If we go along with natural authors, right, it just seems like, well, it seems to be maybe the closest, right? If it has a purpose. But I think this is where you get to some serious issues. Like, I'm joking around right now, but there's some serious implications for this. Uh, this is the classic natural law argument. And so focus on this because this may be on the, the final. Uh, some have argued that if it, of course, if it's unnatural, then it's immoral. And some commonly cited behaviors or actions that are seen as unnatural, right? Or suicide, using contraception, sexual activity. Some people consider them unnatural, therefore they're gonna say that they're immoral. But hopefully you start to see that that claim is based on the assumption that it's already clear what is natural and what is not. And that nature can really provide us morality a guide for morality. I think this is unfortunate, especially in debates of uh, regarding homosexuality. Uh, there's a lot of claims that well, it's unnatural or it's natural. Uh, and I think the, the homosexual community has been put into a very unfortunate situation of trying to prove that it's natural versus unnatural. And I don't think they really have to do that in regards to morality. Because morality, like being natural or natural, doesn't really tell you whether it's right or wrong. But unfortunately, it seems like that's where the debate has gone, right? To try to prove it to be natural versus unnatural. So the problem, I think, is in premise one this connection of just because something is or is not the way doesn't tell us whether it should or should not be the way. I think Hume is right about that. But that's not a good guide. The argument from humanity, again, some have argued as well that perhaps uh, abortion is something unnatural, right? But there's also problems with this argument. So the first premise says it's always wrong to deliberately kill an innocent human being. A fetus is an innocent human being, therefore it's always wrong to deliberately kill a fetus. What's the problem with this argument though? Where's the mistake? Where's the failure in reasoning with this argument? Why is this not a good argument, even though it's a very popular argument? 
Number two. Why number two? Well, I'm not sure, but I think because Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, number two is affirming the consequent? No, 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 not, not quite. That's not quite it's what it's doing. There, but there is an issue. Um, there's actually a couple of issues. What do they mean by human being? How do they define okay. a human being? What are human beings according to this argument? A fetus? Okay, so then, is there a problem with that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so there's, yeah, like I said, there's a number of problems here. They're talking about a, a moral issue, right? That they're connecting human being and fetus. Remember the the fallacies. Yes. So there's a fallacy going. Well, two fallacies going on there. The first one is that, that it begs the question. Remember when you already assume you're correct. Mm -hmm. So you just repeat yourself. So in the first premise, they're saying it's always wrong to dip a lily to a human being. And they're already assumed that, well, then that's a fetus. So they're, they're just repeating themselves, right? At the end. Mm -hmm. They didn't prove anything. They just assumed that it was already true. Okay. And the second is the issue of that human being is very ambiguous here. Because they mean fetus, but... I would say that they're making the mistake of equivocation. Equivocation is when you use one word in two different ways in the same argument. So you're giving two different definitions for one word. Mm -hmm. uh, so begging the question, going back to the fallacies, an example, another example would be, God exists, we know that God exists because the Bible says so, and we should believe what the Bible says because God wrote it. So what is their conclusion there? What are they trying to prove? What? That God exists? That God. Yeah. Right, that God exists. What is the first premise? What is the first statement they make? God exists. So can they prove that God exists by just saying God exists? No. 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 Right. So does everybody see the problem there? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, this is what the argument about abortion is running into, too. It's already assuming it's right. And then equivocation, like I said, is when you have one word but two different meanings so um one of the videos that i gave a link to i thought gave a pretty good example of the problem with equivocation so the argument said that uh miley cyrus is a star and then the second premise said a star is a big ball of gas so then what's the conclusion what's miley cyrus according to that argument. Big ball of gas. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you see, in the first premise, they say they use star as a celebrity. In the second premise, they say, well, a star is a big ball of gas. They don't mean a celebrity, right? They mean the actual physical celestial body. So, and then they try to connect the two together at the end. That is essentially what I'm saying is happening when we when we use these type of arguments where we say uh, fetus is a human being. In that sense, 
I, I would guess that they mean that in, in the sense of a biology, right? Maybe it has the same DNA, or biologically. But when we say that a human being is innocent, that's a moral sense. That's not a biological fact, right? Okay, I see. So then trying to connect the two at the end, that's where I'm saying you're using, to try to use the biology to connect with the morality, and that's what we're seeing was the problem. Right. So it's a very popular argument, but it's a very poor argument. <laughs> and then this is the thing with definitions, right? Is that people will argue, Schiffer Lyman brings this up in the book, when we talk about marriage and the whole thing about uh, same-sex marriage, that people were arguing, well, by definition, a marriage is a relationship between a man and a woman, and that same-sex marriages couldn't qualify. But just by definition alone doesn't tell you whether something is right or wrong. You're already kind of assuming, right? what it is and not proving what it is some and the agreement of marriage is is not necess necessarily that uh historically i mean marriage was for money <laughs> like i mean that, yeah. that is, i mean that is the reality of it is that uh you know people didn't marry for love that's only a recent sort of concept or, or something that we advertise but before it's just for practical purposes of, well, how do you, you grow the family to be richer? How do you get a larger property? You marry into another family. So now you share the properties, right? You share all the resources. So see how the definition alone is not going to be helpful. 